cinema and video games, they have a mutual history of love and hate. Mike talked today, uh, however, it's not about this battle, but about what they have in common. Both cinema and games uh, can be regarded as uh, examples of the narrating mind making sense of the other people in fictional worlds. With NFT virtuality, uh, I refer to the mind that continuously recreates these human encounters in an embodied and situated manner. I will specifically focus on discussing what makes us as humans accept the artificial characters as real people when we engage with them in inactive narrative systems, be those games or movies. My background is in cinematic storytelling, neurocinematics, and currently I'm working with the topic of co-presence with artificial humans. Outline for today's presentation. Uh, first, a short introduction. Then we go to uh, discuss the narrating mind. We look at the epistemology of narrative experience. Then we uh, take a look at the designing inactive narrative systems in a more practical point, point of view. And then we go to conclusions. First introduction. Eight today are to model human face-to-face -face encounters with artificial humans in narrative context, especially focusing on, on narratives as, as an access to a complex context. State of art. So advanced artificial characters have reached seemingly human-like behavior. Uh, the technological and artistic level challenges the uncanny valley argument. For those who are not familiar with uncanny valley argument, uh, Nasahiro Mori, 1970s, a psychologist who uh, studied uh, robotics, uh, wanted to uh, raise the question of how, uh, how um, increasing uh, human likeness in robots would affect uh, to uh, people who interact with them. And he especially uh, reflected on healthy humans. Uh, at a certain point, uh, when uh, the artificial human the robot reaches a human likeness, not human likeness in, in really natural way. Uh, he argued that there will be a collapse in, in uh, empathical responses. People fall into what he calls uncanny valley, where they perceive the artificial human as either a corpse, a dead person, or a zombie. I'm today uh, challenging this, uh, uh, this uncanny valley. Uh, argument uh, with the context. So Mark Sagan uh, in University of Auckland has, has uh, elaborated extremely uh, human-like uh, child uh, that can, uh, can be responsive to human actions. Uh, the motivating problem for my, my presentation today is uh, is to ask uh, what if something just had happened that made the baby ex upset? Uh, maybe uh, it would reply differently than uh, it has been kind of programmed or trained. So uh, the advanced artificial characters have reached seemingly human-like behaviors, but uh, so far they are lacking they are lacking the capability for deep embodied human contextualization. Um, I would like to point out a couple of uh, aspects that, that uh, relate to such deep embodied human contextualization. Uh, consider, for example, what makes humans human uh, in terms of uh, real-time mood changes, childhood traumas, psychological biases, ethical and moral values, lifelong experience, and, and in general, unpredictability that is very natural to humans. Brain is uh, still a black box. So with this motivating problem, uh, we can we can kind of uh, the human artificial human human artificial human interaction uh, to reach the level of hu unique human to human interaction seems a task impossible. Luckily, we have here word seems uh, because uh, it can be argued that uh, this is actually uh, not a technological problem but an experiential problem.
Are you hearing me? We hear you, but the video probably stopped. Okay, uh, I just stopped it, and I'm just uh, I'm just putting. So uh, okay, humans have this cognitive tendency to project human intentions and behaviors to other beings and things. Uh, we reflect against the human human our own individual experiences, constructs uh, our emotions, intentions, and hidden motivations. So uh, in in some sense. Uh, human and artificial human encounters, they rely on the human mind's simulation uh, of natural human to human encounters, given the similar, uh, similar meaningful context. So again, the context is our keyword. But before, before uh, advancing, we need to take a look at the narrating mind. Human mind is, is, uh, is um, our topic uh, and, and here uh, we look first at the theory backgroundings. So uh, my theory backgroundings, uh, how I approach this uh, this uh, challenge, is uh, on inactive cognitive sciences. Uh, in 1991, Varela, Thompson, and Ross they introduced the embodied mind. Uh, it basically uh, induces the core uh, multidisciplinarity, cognitive neurosciences, uh, phenomenological inquiry especially referring back to Merleau Ponty, Husserl, uh, William James, and Hollis Montgomery uh, Later in 1996, uh, Varela proposed a method, method uh, called neurophenomenology, which uh, is specifically uh, aims to find mutual constraints between scientific data and experimental data. So theory of inactive mind, in short, uh, assumes a body-brain world dynamics, which is fundamentally intertwined and interdependent. It challenges both computational and representational theories of mind. And it undermines standard positions in the philosophy of mind, such as the idea that mind is identical to the brain. So, in short, mind is situated, embodied, extended. Um, an active approach has its uh, groundings in in dynamical systems and and we want to look back to in history to the to the pioneers of uh, dynamic systems first that uh, comes into my mind biosemiosis uh, pioneered by estonian jacob von yuk school in 19, 1930s organism and its environmental environment constitute a system with feedback loop uh, second order cybernetics, uh, cybernetics was developed with Margaret Mead, Heinz von Förster, uh, observing system that observes a system, and this can go at infinite effect. And then uh, closer to uh, inactive, um, inactive uh, approach, elaborators uh, Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, their autopoiesis theory, which, uh, which proposes a system capable of defining, reproducing, and maintaining itself. So, uh, an image of Yuxkul's biosemiosis, just uh, to uh, uh, inspire the viewers. So, Yuxkul um, uh, especially focused on, on the idea of, of a kind of a closed loop between uh, an organism and, and its environment. But this was, uh, this was divided into the inner realm, which is the organism itself, uh, perception action loop within, within the organism, and, and that organism then interacting with the world in a meaningful manner. So there's a, there's a perceptual attention to targets and meaningful targets. And this creates a it circulate, uh, circulate feedback loop between the organism and the, and the external world. Then Mead and von Fester, uh, the second order cybernetics uh, um, extended um, basically the first order feedback loop of the organism uh, to, uh, or a system to uh, added, adding a second feedback loop which modifies the first order, order feedback loop. And Maturan and Varela, they are out of then. Uh, was especially introduced for uh, like organic systems with uh, with a boundary starting from a cell. Uh, organic system with a boundary generates a metabolic re reaction network, uh, produces uh, molecular components which determine the system. 
uh, ad, in, ad infinitum. Uh, and the organism is also affected by the input interacting with its, in, with its world inseparably with its world through input and output systems. So all these systems have the organism tightly connected to feedback loop with, uh, with its uh, environmental context surroundings. What uh, the, the three layers of emergence of this type of self worth relation uh, can be understood in terms of narration. Now we are talking about narration as, as in a wider and broader uh, meaning than uh, it is uh, usually understood in terms of literature uh, or film narration. Here we are talking about narration as, a, as a, almost like a synonym for cognition, for human cognition, for human. Uh, tool for human mind to make sense of the world. And so we have uh, kind of the biological level where uh, we can argue that there's an outer narration, self-determined and self-organizing way that the, that, that the homeostatic, the biological system makes sense of the, of the, of the world and, and kind of uh, maintains it, its uh, well-being. Then we have temporalized uh, self-reference at the level of conscious experience which is a kind of a telling stories to oneself, and then a conceptual narrative construction at the level of intersubjectivity, where we are sharing stories and narratives with the others. One dynamic loop that I want to bring forth here is Ulrich Neisser's, Neisser's uh, perceptual cycle, and here I have adapted it to uh, sense making via narratives. So um, we can we can. Uh, start the loop from any part of these three sections but okay we can we can think of the anticipation of future events uh, that direct experience of the events that uh, that this experience of the events in turn reconstructs a narrative narrative modifies anticipation of the future e events and this goes on at infinitum continuously changing loop so dynamics of a narrating mind uh, can be can be uh, listed. Um, this list, of course, is not complete. Just to I think the video is heavy, so I need to stop it occasionally just to get the uh, voice back. Con continuously constructs uh, and reconstructs e explications. It creates co coherence by filling up gaps. It recycles what, what it already knows. And this uh, previous experience uh, enables the organism to anticipate future experiences. The, this allows also, uh, the whole system also allows creating non-existing ideas and imagining the yet unimagined. Here, a philosophical example would be uh, widely, widely used in philosophy is an imagine a unicorn, a horse with a, with a um, thing on its nose, horn, and, and the fact that these do not, or actually they have not encountered yet with the world. So um, the, the uh, narrating mind uh, in, in neuroscientific case studies. So uh, now I want to go into um, kind of um, studies uh, that have looked at the narrative comprehension in, in human mind using a functional, functional, uh, neuro, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, this is an example of uh, just uh, one one of many ways how we can kind of take grasp and capture the dynamically uh, changing uh, aspects of, of a human mind. Especially from the paradigm of neurocinematics, which I've also uh, myself uh, uh, contributed. Um, point, it was first point by Hassan and, and colleagues uh, in 2008, that was introduced this concept, neurocinematics. And, and then um, in uh, 2011, I started to work with my own neuroscience research group, looking specifically on, on narrative comprehension. All these uh, works that are, the, actually I'm going to present two different works, and, and both they, uh, they um, are completed, executed at the Aalto University Aalto Neuro Imaging Lab. Uh, this is the film by, uh, Aki Kaurismäki, Max Factory Girl, 
and this was one of the first uh, films that we uh, showed in, in our neuroscience mm -hmm. studies about the universe. In, in this uh, image, you can see um, the two halves of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the brain from internal views of both hemispheres. Uh, and gray means uh, private thought, orange means intersubjectively shared. If you think there's something between us, you are mistaken. Think you touch me less than your attachment. It would be better if you go away. What we are going to see now is um, is an example of how intersubjective uh, experiences, intersubjectively shared experiences, emerge in the brain. So we had uh, 12, uh, 12 uh, subjects who watched separately this uh, same film, and within this same, and in, when the brain data was synchronized, we uh, recognized, we could identify this dynamically emerging synchronization in people's brains that related to rudeness and emotional content and, and complexity of this particular scene uh, in all the viewers' brains. So, uh, what, I, what I want to uh, now present uh, to, to my um, own exper experiments um, with the questions related to narrative. So, can narrative content be different? From, uh, from the fall. Here uh, we showed a film by uh, Sarah Hanfel, Heartbeats. It's an, it's an episode film, and this it is just an excerpt, excerpt, excerpt of that, uh, that film. So in this film, um, the test subject uh, witnessed a young girl's experience of her mother's nurse breakdown, a very drama dramatic film. What we did also, we uh, synchronized the text, uh, uh, the content of the film in the textual form based on the screenplay. And what we could found uh, when comparing the, the um, brain data uh, based on uh, independent component analysis between uh, these different groups of uh, proof, these different conditions between our viewers, we could uh, see that there are certain brain areas that uh, synchronize delivered. So both in, uh, both in text reading and movie viewing, uh, the brain synchronizes, especially in frontal parts of the brain, uh, where uh, our cognitive and emotional um, instruments, mm, physiological instruments like brain regions. Uh, so we could argue that, uh, that um, uh, these uh, five uh, networks, narrative comprehensive networks, are uh, modality in invariant, independent on which form the the narrative context is delivered. So the second second uh, experiment um, is uh, asks if there are differences in brain activity when watching emotional drama drama versus experimental film. So in previous one we had a similar same context uh, and content in in different forms. Here we have two different different films uh, with different contents. And the second film, uh, we, we showed a uh, Maya Deren film, a black and white film, uh, where the director uh, deliberately argues that he wanted to get, she wanted to get rid of, uh, of uh, both uh, plot and emotions. And we compared that, that uh, result with the previous film you saw, the emotional film uh, with witnessing uh, the mother's nurse breakdown. And, and interestingly, what, what we could see, uh, uh, using the functional uh, functional uh, connection uh, analysis, 
uh, without differences. So the drama-driven film produced higher intercepted correlation between Experimental film produced stronger long distance functional according to the higher frontal pole degree distribution than the drama film. So, um, in putting in a very simple one, one liner, the result we could say that the experimental film requires more cognitive effort, while the drama film was uh, really takes uh, the emotional, emotion, uh, emotional uh, mind and, and leads it through the story. So, uh, in summary, uh, we, we could. Uh, and kind of thinking of narrative as a means of sense making. So, uh, narrative sense making is a core function of human cognition, and, and narrative context defines uh, one situation. And there's always a story uh, told to oneself behind the stories told to others. Now, uh, next, uh, we are going to look, uh, look at the epistemology of, of, of narrative experience. And, and this approach, uh, the epistemological approach, uh, relies on, on uh, Charles Sanders Peirce's uh, pragmaticist assumption. So, two domains of knowledge are not enough to explain each other, but a third is required to provide the interpretative angle. And now this uh, triangulation um, is going to be applied throughout the, the following sections of, of this presentation. So we can think of the human-computer interaction, or we can think of the human-artificial uh, agent uh, encounter, which is my and and uh, and uh, computerized system interacting. Then we ask, like, what what is the experience? What is the experience that the human human uh, this generates for the human? And then we need to ask, in which context this this takes place? So, in, in a proposing kind of methodological triangle uh, between, between these different uh, elements, so we can argue that context uh, provides interpretative angle to the, uh, in to the human, human and computer interaction and, and as such defining and, and allowing access to uh, discuss the experience. And, and uh, instead of context, I would like to uh, point out uh, the focus to narrative, because narrative allows structuring the context. So uh, this is uh, the relation between context described by, by narratives, and narratives allow us uh, access, access um, to uh, analyze that context. So, uh, in summary, for this uh, this epistemological aspect of triangulation, so a triangulation uh, frames multidisciplinary inquiry into human experience. Uh, it allows describing human cognition in a context-relative manner. It assumes continuously looping feedback. It's a dynamical system. It relies on cross-referencing between these, five, these disciplines, uh, continuous feedback loops. And from here, uh, from epistemology, we move to uh, practical, uh, practical uh, implementation. How, do, how does this uh, triangulation support designing experiences in terms of uh, second order systems? So especially we want to look at the implications for designing experiences when we look at the designing inactive narrative systems. My, my notion, second order authorship, which I introduced in, in uh, inactive cinema, uh, Simulatorium Eisensteinense in 2008, uh, actually allows us to even further elaborate the epistemological triangle and, and to put um, the authorship on top of the, top of the, top of the graph. So, uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, second author authorship uh, authors a system of three different elements, which are narrative, human experience, and, and the computerized, uh, computerized uh, system. When uh, first, uh, first taking a look at uh, this, is kind of going to media archaeology, so designing inactive cinema. 
going to media archaeology in, in that sense that um, in 2005 I, I introduced uh, or premiered my NFT cinema installation Obsession, which was actually first, uh, first in the world of database cinema that really uh, aimed to, uh, to manage and control uh, a fictional story in, in, in a situation where the feedback, uh, feedback from uh, viewers' uh, physiological responses was tracked and, and, and fed into the system. And um, this was before virtual reality, uh, so it was a um, four screen gallery, gallery space with uh, big screens, uh, five chairs in the middle with embedded biosensors tracking view experience. We, had heart, we measured heart rate and skin conductance. And in addition to that, we had uh, rotation sensors tracking viewing direction. So uh, both, of, both of these uh, elements are way, ways to attempt to uh, uh, get hold uh, to the viewer experience and how that experience can then fed back to the, to the inactive, to the cinematic uh, system. So uh, what we call an active loop uh, is, the, is the viewing uh, causes psychophysiological changes. These are measured. The measurements are fed into the what we call montage machine, which which then, uh, based on the algorithm, recombines uh, recombines and calls uh, new elements, uh, media elements from a content element database, which are then played on the screen. Of course, we had a little bit uh, more complex system. We had four screens, and one of the screens was uh, made as as. Um, a dominating screen and two others were slaves for that, uh, that content of that uh, dominating screen. Um, okay, in this inactive cinema installation design where I had collaborated with Rasmus, Rasmus Juori for software architecture and, and Jonas Jutilainen for sensor design. Uh, so we had media sample based uh, pre recorded database, a story, a fictional film uh, that I had. Uh, directed. Uh, live edits uh, in real time uh, were, were, uh, were based on distance in similarity map based on, on, the, uh, on the samples, media samples. Unconscious interaction th through biosensor feedback and interpretation based on scientifically accumulated knowledge of physiological signals. So um, this is then a very important aspect of the, of the interpretation, uh, so interpretation of sensor data. So already in 2005, I, I, even though this was an uh, artistic work, um, um, artistic in some cinematic installation, I based the interpretation uh, of, of those uh, viewer biofeedback to uh, scientific studies, to, to the body of scientific studies on, on these, um, these uh, skin conductance, heart rate uh, relation, and how they, they uh, affect emotional responses, or how they can be interpreted. Okay, but then we, the, we do uh, almost a 20 year jump to uh, designing inactive encounters. So now we are talking about uh, human, uh, this male here on, on represents the human, and then an artificial agent, the female on the, on the uh, Right side presents uh, the artificial agent with uh, with his uh, her mesh on on top of, and so uh, how do we design uh, this kind of encounters? So uh, what what I call like uh, we are not going to talk about what I call an in action model for human artificial human encounter. So uh, here taking the taking the um, uh, second order, second order author, authoring into account. We have uh, a system where the author needs to kind of uh, manage and try to control to some extent uh, human behavior, artificial human behavior, and, and in terms of the annotated narrative context. So here, uh, what, what we are what we are currently developing, working on, with the work that has already started. We are applying machine learning to human artificial human encounter in context. So basically, what we we do, we uh, build a machine learning system to uh, manage uh, and train the system 
system uh, with with these different data from these different corners. So uh, what, what we are going to do, uh, we're collecting behavioral data of human, artificial human encounter. So we're first talking about, um, so we have two, two ways to do this. Uh, there are more ways, but I present uh, one way is that we actually use um, synchronous uh, film material where two people are interacting with one another in a synchronous manner. So our, our idea is that we, uh, we uh, uh, especially build uh, this uh, training system on, on this, uh, the interaction, uh, the systemic interaction between these true two characters. Not one character, not the other one, but their interaction, the dynamical interaction. And the dynamical interaction takes place in an annotated context. Another way is to do, uh, to do this is to uh, introduce test subjects into the, into the laboratory and, and then record their data in, in terms of when they uh, are engaged with a narrative context, a dramatized context. So, um, then we, uh, then we uh, had to look at the context, context annotation in this uh, human, artificial human encounter. So this, this is a very laborious uh, part of, of and, and uh, you can do it uh, with, uh, with, a, with a minimal effort or with maximal effort, uh, but it, it, you, you still kind of need to have this, this uh, context uh, annotation uh, in order, in order to order to actually claim that you are creating and actually working with human human like situate situates human to human situates when you uh, work with humans and artificial agents. So, um, how to access a relevant deep embodied human context? So, uh, once again, we, we can go back to these uh, questions like uh, what makes humans human? It is like real real time mood changes, childhood traumas psychological biases, uh, ethical and moral values, lifelong experience, whatever they can be. So, uh, so this context uh, is through annotation. And as I said, it's, it's a, it can be done in an extreme uh, the more information it gives us of, of, of that, that, uh, that situatedness between the human and the artificial human. So we need to try to find the mutual constraints between often incommensurable quanti quantitative scientific data and qualitative experimental data. So uh, phenomenological inquiry allows us descriptions of experience, for example, microphenomenology is a way uh, that many, many neuroscientists are also using. Um, on, on studying the first person experience of the subject. Hermeneutics and methods of interpretation, narratology, uh, structural and conceptual models, cognitive sciences, dynamical models, for example, embodied metaphor theory by Lego and Johnson, psychology, social sciences, which allow observe, observing behavioral responses to context and then neuro and psychophysiological studies where we can observe body brain responses to the context. This is just, uh, it, this is not a complete list, but just to show you multi need for multidisciplinary effort. So then uh, we have machine learning of dyadic human artificial agent encounter behavior. Uh, machine learning of dyadic human artificial agent encounter human and artificial human agent encounter behavior in context. Uh, it's, it's complex. Uh, so, um, here again, um, the, the three corners, annotated narrative context, human behavior, and artificial human behavior. So we, we can assume that if human behavior is this way, uh, then uh, in, in, I mean, in annotated narrative context, so then artificial human behavior should, should kind of uh, act in, in, in that way. Uh, there must be, of course, evaluation in terms of the human response, how human, human responses to that, and, and the modifications. Uh, just, a, just a theoretical kind of um, example of, of those, uh, the complexity of that, those relations. 
So now we are looking at the symbiotic experience, symbiotic experience design. And with the, with the, notion, the notion of symbiotic, I want to credit uh, to my uh, former colleague, uh, Dr. Ilkka Kosunen, who actually introduced me this term. Uh, so with the symbiotic experience design, uh, we understand that we bring together human intelligence and then we an artificial intelligence uh, in context. So uh, here, symbiotic uh, second order authorship, uh, human intelligence uh, with artificial um, intelligence uh, controlling and, and managing the the shared and the inactive media system. So inactive narrative system uh, is is can be then managed. With, with within uh, this uh, second order complexity, symbiotic second order authorship. Okay, um, so at the at the end, um, approaching the end of my presentation, I want to just uh, briefly show two case studies uh, of uh, human artificial human encounters that we've been working with. Uh, the first one is an artistic experiment, uh, The State of Darkness. Um, uh, it is a VR experience of face-to-face -face meeting with a stranger inside a prison cell. So it's a fictional story uh, which builds on, on um, imagining uh, you are meeting a stranger uh, who you have to kind of negotiate in that immersive dark prison cell space. You have to negotiate somehow your relation to this, this character, this human, and what binds you together. And it's a face-to-face -face encounter, and our character has very shut, very sub, subtle, very uh, small, uh, very um, shuttle movements, uh, facial expressions. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, the, 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 there is an extremely uh, rich context around so you have a very rich uh, sound environment which which uh, refers to um, your um, kind of a fiction film genre uh, prison cell environment so you clicking clicking uh, fees and and water drops and and people's uh, shouts on the corridors then on the other hand we have uh, we have a um, uh, what we call uh, inactive, inactive scenography. So uh, both the both the character behavior and then the virtual scenography are changing in real time. Here we have uh, the blob on the background um, responding to the heartbeat of of the of the, of the person. So, uh, state of darkness is a kind of uh, proof of concept uh, for putting a human to face an, an artificial human in an in a strong uh, dramatized context, and try then studying uh, the different aspects of, of this this uh, this relation and how context actually affects that. that. And in, in, in terms of these uh, narrative uh, characters, uh, we have to, or artificial characters, we have to think of the, the trustfulness, uh, their friendliness, attentiveness, uh, shared attention by eye gaze, and, and in general, just the feel of co-presence. Okay, then we had another experiment, uh, which is a uh, I define here as more scientific experiment, the booth. Uh, it's a study of face-to-face -face meeting with an asylum seeker. So in this one, uh, the participant takes a role of an immigration officer. And he, she listens to the artificial asylum seeker story by, uh, and looks at the dynamical uh, storyteller's face and, and decides whether accept or reject an asylum seeker. And here uh, we uh, especially collected uh, the information of our subjective background, background how personal attitude questionnaire, how they, um, what is their opinion, attitude towards refugees. And then we did a content annotation. So we had two different characters with very, uh, very similar but still different stories with both emotional and, and neutral sections. And, and uh, this 
and by synchronizing, and then we collected uh, biodata, e.g. heart rate and, and skin conductance from, from our subjects, and, and uh, then uh, built a predictive uh, machine learning mo model to predict uh, from physiology if the participants were experiencing empathy. And, and this was shown. Um, we also found out that most of the, our subjects, pilot subjects, uh, pilot study subjects uh, actually accepted the asylum seekers application. So uh, for future challenges are uh, like really the inaction model for human, artificial human encounters in context. And experimental context, how to access relevant deep embodied human context. This is the key question. And access to context uh, can take place via annotations in, in and now just uh, showing again this slide with these, uh, these different disciplinary me methods that we need to bring together in order to kind of uh, build this tetracon of experience, second order experience design. And in conclusion, concluding, uh, I would like to say that uh, I would like to just uh, like take home messages uh, that human likeness of artificial humans relies on narrative contextualization. And narrative context emerges in NFP mind as a dynamical body brain world system. And epistemic triangulation as a means of binding experiential context to systemic dynamics of human artificial human encounters. And Experience uh, design is, uh, has been described in terms of uh, epistemology, so interdisciplinary triangulation, and uh, methodology would be triadic annotation model, and application would be to human and artificial human encounters in mediated immersive environments for social, cultural, and, and creative ends. And I'm, I'm happy to answer the questions uh, in the Q&A, looking forward to meet you all in person. Thank you.